In our time together, I want to address the issue of the transgenerational you when it comes to Israel and Israel in prophetic text in the Bible. Now, some of you may be saying, what in the world is a transgenerational you, and how does that relate to Israel? Well, the precondition for understanding the transgenerational you is to understand that Israel is a corporate national entity that transcends any particular generation of Israel. A transgenerational you occurs when God addresses a current generation of Israel and a future or past generation of Israel in the same passage. So that's why we're calling it trans in this regard. It goes across different generations of Israel. And you are going to actually have passages in the Bible, like some we are going to look at, where God can be addressing a current group of Israelites, a present generation of Israel, and he will use the word you concerning them, and he will make statements that are very relevant to them directly and immediately. But in the same chapter or passage, you will also find you used clearly of a future generation or generations of Israel. And so that's going to be key here is the word trans is going to refer to going across many generations. We find the transgenerational you in the very strategic text of Leviticus chapter 26. And what you have here is God is laying out for Israel that if Israel obeys the Mosaic covenant, Israel is going to be allowed to stay in the, in the land of Israel to experience the continual blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. But if Israel were to disobey, then God will actually drive Israel out of the land and there will be curses and dispersion. So significantly, when we're looking at Leviticus 26, we're going to see God using you of a current group of Israel with implications for them and immediately beyond that. But then also into the distant future, particularly discussing issues uh, such as Israel scattering and then eventually gathering after a period of dispersion. Now, one of the things that I've done as we look at these passages, I have already pre-highlighted uh, the word you in these particular texts. So as you scan down here, you can see there's a lot of you <laughs> that is highlighted in Leviticus 26. We're not going to mention all of them. But if you notice, like in verse 1, we have the statement, you shall not make for yourselves idols, nor shall you set up for yourselves an image. Verse 2, you shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. Verse 3, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments. And so you have a lot of you that is obviously very relevant to the current group of Israel that is uh, eventually en route to possessing the promised land of Israel. And really what you have laid out here is that if Israel keeps the Mosaic Covenant, there's all these blessings that are promised them. And then when you get to verse 14, God starts to address the issue of what happens if Israel disobeys God. Verse 14, but if you do not obey me and do not carry out all my commandments, if instead you reject my statutes. And then what you have discussed here are a lot of uh, consequences, negative consequences uh, for Israel. Uh, verse 18 says, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Verse 21, if you act with hostility against me and are unwilling to obey me, I will increase the plague on you uh, seven times. Verse 23, and if by these things you are not turned to me, but act with hostility against me, then I will act with hostility against you. Then what will be the result of Israel's disobedience is go are going to be uh, negative consequences that extend into the future for Israel and even beyond the current group of Israelites at this time who have not even begun possession of the land. For example, in verse 33, if Israel continues to disobey God, gets, God says, you, however, I will scatter among the nations and will draw out a sword after you as your land becomes desolate and your cities become waste. Now that's starting to talk pretty far ahead of where the Israelites are at this particular time. Because again, remember, at the time of Leviticus 26, they haven't even begun the conquest of the land under Joshua. And here God's talking about that if you're in the land and then you disobey, then there's going to be a scattering to the nations and uh, your land becoming desolate. Now this current group of Israelites is not going to see the fulfillment of that, but that is promised um, for a future generation if Israel disobeys. And then verse 34 says, then the land will enjoy its Sabbaths all the days of the desolation while you are in your enemy's land. So that's talking about actually being in the land of other nations, which is pretty far away from this current generation of Israel. And when you get to verses 40 to 45, particularly verse 40, uh, projects even after uh, the scattering of Israel to the nations, we're told that if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their forefathers, 
Then verse 42 says, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and I will remember also my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham as well, and I will remember the land. So when you get to verses 40 to 45, that's actually talking about the possibility of Israel being restored back to the land after a period of dispersion to the nations. So the key thing to get here from Leviticus 26 is that God is certainly addressing the current generation of Israel, the current group of Israelites with implications for them. But then he starts talking about things in the future, such as dispersion, scattering to the nations, then eventually a regathering. So clearly we are seeing a transgenerational you in Leviticus 26, because you can be used of Israel in the present, and then also talk about Israel in the future. We see a very similar scenario in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Now, if you look at Deuteronomy 4, again, notice here that there are a lot of references to you that are highlighted, and a lot of these yous are going to be very relevant to the current group of Israel at this time, at the time of Moses. Uh, verse 1, now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. And then we're told, you shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, those words have a lot of significance to the you of Moses's day. But as you move on throughout Deuteronomy 4, particularly as you get to verse 25, this is talking about Israel as you, but in the far future. Notice in verse 25, when you become the father of children and children's children and have remained long in the land and act corruptly. So it's talking about, you know, Israel's, uh, you know, sin as a nation against God. Verse 26 says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will surely perish quickly from the land where you are going over the Jordan to possess. You shall not live long on it, but will be utterly destroyed. And then notice verse 27, the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord drives you. Now, we know historically that's going to happen in Israel's history, but from the standpoint of Deuteronomy 4, that's that's a long time away. There you will serve God's, the work of man's hands. That's what verse 28 uh, states. But then notice in verse 29, when it's projected that Israel will be scattered to nations, we're told but from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. So when Israel has gone into the land and then is kicked out of the land, and they're in the nations, if they end up coming to a point where they seek the Lord your God and search for him, God's going to restore them. Notice verse 30, when you are in distress and all these things have come upon you in the latter days. So in that latter days, again, goes to show you here that this is a long time away from the current generation of Israel at the time of Moses. But notice that in the latter days, what you will return to the Lord your God and listen to his voice. So that's talking about a, a restoration of Israel uh, in the latter days. So like Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 4 uses you of a current group of Israel, but then goes into the future Israel that is scattered to the nations, then eventually Israel that is uh, restored uh, when belief occurs. Deuteronomy 30 next is very important when it comes to understanding God's big picture purposes for Israel, and we see the transgenerational you here as well. Now, Deuteronomy 30 is coming in the context of Deuteronomy 28 to 30, where in Deuteronomy 28 and 29, God is laying out blessings for obedience to the Mosaic Covenant for Israel, and then he talks about curses, including dispersion to the nations. So when you get to chapter 30, all of that has been laid out. Then we definitely see transgenerational you in Deuteronomy 30. Notice in verse 1, So it shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you. So that's a pretty big picture right there, because he's, he's saying, you know, Israel, when you're in the land, there's going to be blessing, and then there's going to be curse. And then notice, and you called them to mind in all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you. So that's projecting into the future banishment uh, from the land uh, to the nations. Now, again, remember, it, uh, just like with the other text we've looked at in Deuteronomy 30, the initial conquest of the land under Joshua has not even begun yet. Now God's talking about Israel being uh, scattered again, and then, uh, as we will see, brought back into the land. Verse 2 says that when this occurs, when you call these things to mind in the nations— and you will, uh, and you return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all your heart and soul, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons. Then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you, and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. So that's talking about a, a 
time period of restoration of Israel after being scattered to the nations. Verse 4, if your outcast are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will bring you back. The Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. So this is clearly uh, in the distant future. Uh, verse 6, uh, I think, actually has new covenant implications for Israel, where we're told, moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul so that you may live. So that's actually talking about the salvation uh, of, of Israel on, on, a, on a corporate national level that's going to come in the future after this dispersion takes place. Now, again, you can read the rest of the chapter and you can see more uses of the transgenerational you. But one of the things I think we're seeing here, we're seeing a pattern with Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 4, uh, Deuteronomy 30. I think you also see this in Ezekiel 20. If you have time to do it, go look at Ezekiel and you'll see a, uh, Ezekiel 20, you'll see a very similar thing. But we're seeing this pattern that when God is addressing Israel as a corporate national entity, uh, he, he can talk about Israel in the present and then Israel in the distant future. Now, do we see the transgenerational you concept in regard to Israel in the New Testament? And the answer to that is an emphatic yes. As a matter of fact, we see this very clearly in Matthew chapter 23, where the transgenerational you will be used of Israel, not only in the present, uh, the Israelites of Jesus's day, but Israel of the past and then Israel in the future. Now, like we did with the other passages, when you look at Matthew 23 here, notice uh, the, the yous are highlighted. So there are a lot of yous going on in Matthew 23. And starting in verse 13, uh, during Jesus' Passion Week, after uh, he entered uh, Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, uh, he is uh, pronouncing some harsh woes to the scribes and the Pharisees, who are the leaders of Israel. And, and the leaders of Israel, you know, they represent, you know, Israel as a whole. And Jesus really uh, gets after them for the way that they have acted. And he will use you of the current Israelite leadership to refer to the group of people who are standing before him at that time. Verse 13 says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Notice verse 15, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Same with verse 16. So you get the point here. There are a lot of references to the leaders of Israel currently standing before Jesus. So there's no doubt that Israel's leadership with implications for Israel as a whole being addressed with the you that Jesus is directing towards them. Now, things get really interesting when you get to verses 34 through the, the end of the chapter, which is verse 39. And this is where we see that the transgenerational you can actually have implications for the future, but also for the past as well. So in verse 34, Jesus says, therefore, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. So that, that again, that's still in the present here because uh, this is talking about events that are going to quickly unfold. But then in verse 35, Jesus tells the religious leaders, so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. That's very interesting in verse 35, because we're seeing a generational connection where the current group of Israel's leaders are are deserving of these woes that Jesus is giving them. And he actually says that there's a sense where the, the guilt of what's taken place before, even concerning the killing of Abel, all the way to the blood of Zechariah, whom Jesus says, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. So this is where we get that past aspect of the transgenerational you. The current group of Israel's leaders did not kill uh, Zechariah between the altar, but Jesus acts as if they did which again shows that connection between the acts of Israel and Israel's leaders in the past and what's happening in the future. So that is actually a case where the transgenerational you applies to uh, what Israelite leaders of the past had done. Notice whom you murdered between the temple and the altar in reference to uh, Zechariah. So that again shows that transgenerational connection between acts of Israel in the past and what's going on in the future. And then Jesus goes on to say, truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So the acts of Israel from the past and in the present are going to come together with what we believe to be the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in AD 70, which is discussed right after this. So in verse 37, Jesus says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. 
how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But notice, and you were unwilling. So Jesus wanted to gather the people of Israel. He, he wanted their salvation. In Matthew 4, 17, Jesus proclaimed to Israel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But we're told here that you were unwilling. So Israel has been unwilling, and that obviously involves the current generation of Israel. Now, Jesus pronounces a judgment upon the current group of Israel. He says in verse 38, behold, your house is being left to you desolate. We believe that that is a prediction of the coming AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem and the temple by the Romans. Now, notice in verse 39, this is where I think we get more transgenerational implications of the you. Jesus goes on to say in verse 39, for I say to you, from now on, you will not see me. Now, again, that still does apply to the current group. And so Jesus says, you know, I'm saying to you, from now on, you will not see me. I think that refers to Jesus removing his presence from Israel. You know, he's going to die. He's going to be raised. He's going to ascend to heaven. Uh, but, you know, in Luke 19, verses 41 to 44, Jesus said that Israel missed their day of visitation. And I think that's what he's talking about here when he says, you will not see me. In other words, Jesus is not going to rule from Jerusalem over Israel with all the blessings that that entails at this particular time. Because they are rejecting him, his presence is going to be removed from them, but it's only for a while. And the reason we say that is, is you get the very important word until. And whenever you see eschatological untils in the Bible, note them because they usually indicate a reversal of the previous circumstances. So Jesus is telling Israel and Israel's leaders that you will not see me. In other words, he's going to go away for a while, but it's until. And when the events following this until occur, there's going to be a reversal of the previous negative circumstance. So you will not see me, what, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, what does that refer to? That refers to the future salvation of Israel. That's very significant with Zechariah 12.10, that in connection with end times events, uh, they, the people of Israel will look on him whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him. That's very consistent with Romans 11.26, which talks about the coming salvation of all Israel. So Jesus says here, you're not going to see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is a quotation from Psalm 118, which is a happy psalm talking about Israel's blessings. So there is going to come a day in which Israel will cry out to Jesus, the Messiah, in a salvation context and mean it from the heart. But notice that Jesus says it's until you say. Now, clearly the current group of Israel is not saying this from a good heart. <laughs> They're not saying this in the sense of salvation or belief in Jesus, the Messiah. But there is coming a future generation that will. So I believe that in this, this last you in verse 39, where it says, until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that that you is referring to a future generation of Israel that will cry out to Jesus in salvation. As I mentioned, that would be Zechariah 12, 10. That would be Romans uh, eleven twenty six. So we're seeing the transgenerational you here concerning a future generation of Israel that will cry out in salvation to the Lord. And so this verse does predict a coming salvation of Israel, but we also want to catch too that there is a condition for that, which is until you say. So Israel as a nation has to call out to Jesus in, in order for the blessings of the Messiah and the kingdom uh, to occur for them. So I do think that Matthew 23 as a whole is very interesting because again, notice we get a lot of yous being used in this chapter. And we saw that you is used a lot of the current generation of Israel, but we did see in verse 35 that uh, there were transgenerational implications from the past. And then we saw in verse 39 that uh, there's going to be a you coming someday who will say, blessed is you comes in the name of the Lord. So we see the transgenerational you really a lot in Matthew 23, including Israel past, present, and future. Well, up to this point, I think we have established pretty well that there is a transgenerational you that often appears uh, in Scripture concerning Israel, and it's usually in the context of big picture statements concerning you know Israel and Israel's future. So we've seen it all over the place with Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 30, Ezekiel 20, even though we didn't look at that, you'll find that there as well. And then we saw it a lot in Matthew chapter 23. Now, before we close, I would like to say that I actually do think we see the transgenerational you also appear 
in Matthew chapter 24. So I just wanted to state here that we're not going to cover everything that there is, but I, I do want to simply state that I personally do think that the transgenerational you does appear in Matthew 24, because I think what's going on in Matthew 24 is the apostles are going to you know, be asking uh, questions concerning when will these things be, and then what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And then Jesus will start to use the word you as he answers the apostles in regard to their question, but then he ends up talking about things that are clearly related to the future, things that would be related to the 70th week of Daniel, the future tribulation period, uh, the uh, salvation and uh, rescue of Israel at the end of the tribulation period, Jesus' own second coming. Now, I know when you're dealing with Matthew 24, there's going to be different approaches. There's going to be the preterist approach, which sees uh, basically Matthew 24 is being fulfilled by the time of AD 70. There's going to be historicist approach, which believes, you know, these events are going on throughout uh, church history. And then there's the futurist view, which is my view, which is I, I think we're dealing a lot with the future uh, 70th week of Daniel, or what we could refer to as the seven-year tribulation period. But to put it all together, I, I do believe that the transgenerational you is found in Matthew 24. So just to make a few comments on this, you know, when you come to Matthew 24, you're clearly coming off of Matthew 23, verses 34 to 39, where we did see the transgenerational you used of Israel, present and past and future. When Jesus makes that statement about the, in verse 38, about your house being left to you desolate, and then he talks about uh, there's going to come a day where Israel is going to cry out to him in salvation, where a you will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When you roll into chapter 24, we're told that Jesus came out from the temple and as he was going away, or he was going away, when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him, and he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down, which is reiterating what he stated in Matthew 23, 38, concerning the destruction of the temple. Now, when you come to verse 3, this is where you actually have the beginning of the Olivet Discourse, and we're told as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they're having a question concerning when these things will happen. Now, it could be that these things refers back to the statement concerning the destruction of the temple. I personally think that the, these things, because the way the rest of the discourse plays out, um, that the question is broader than just the temple. Because like when you look at verse uh, 8, Jesus is going to say, but all these things, all of these things refers to the uh, false messianic claims, wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquakes, et cetera, what's discussed in, in verses four to seven. So I actually think that the uh, these things uh, is fairly broad and includes what is going on in uh, the tribulation period. And then you have the question concerning what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age at the latter part of verse three. So they're asking concerning the sign of your coming. Uh, the coming would refer to Jesus's full manifestation as Messiah and King and ruling over Jerusalem, Israel, uh, and the nations, the, the full messianic age, the age to come. Now, what ends up happening in verses four to eight, you get, you know, what are referred to as the, uh, the beginning of birth pangs. And notice that Jesus says, see to it that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, will mislead many. Notice you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Then he goes on to say at the end of verse six, see that you are not frightened. So you have all those things that are that are uh, linked with uh, the birth pangs. Then in verse nine, he talks about tribulation. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. So there's a lot of you going on in verses uh, four to 14. Now, verses four to 14, there's a lot of debate of what's going on in there. Uh, you know, obviously a preterist view would be that verses four to 14 is describing, you know, things leading up to and including uh, AD 70. Um, there's others who are going to see that, you know, these are the things that take place basically between the first and second comings of Christ, which would include this age. I believe verses four to 14 uh, is referring to events within the 70th week of Daniel or a, or a future tribulation period. Now, obviously, whether you go with a preterist view, a, histor a historicist view, or a futurist view is going to affect how you view those things. I, I personally, when I when I look at these things here, um, the false messianic claims, I, I don't think that was fulfilled in the, in the first century. I think it's going to be particularly true of the coming tribulation period. Uh, the way things are clustered here with wars, rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, that doesn't really seem to fit the uh, the peace of Rome. Uh, of of the first century, I know there's little there there's various things that are happening at that particular time, but it doesn't seem to fit. 
uh, really the, the first century. So I, I think those things are referring to the future. Now, when it comes to tribulation, clearly there is tribulation taking place uh, in the first century. The apostles experienced persecution. But I think when you get to verse 15 and following, uh, you're really dealing with with things that are still future from our standpoint, because Jesus will see, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. And so you have this abomination of desolation, which seems to be linked with uh, Daniel 9.27, where the prince who is to come or the Antichrist uh, breaks his seven-year covenant with the people of Israel at the midway point, at the three-and-a-half-year point of the tribulation period. This leads to intense persecution of Israel. You get some more use statements here. Uh, notice in verse 23, if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. Jesus says in verse 25, behold, I have told you in advance so that they would not be deceived. So he's using you in connection with the abomination of desolation. I think when you get to the abomination of desolation, we're 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 dealing with a with a future event. And then we're told in verse 29, but immediately after the tribulation of those days, you have the cosmic sign. Sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the he of of the heavens will be shaken. That is also referring to future events. And then what I think is really significant, in verses 30 to 31, you have the second coming of Jesus to earth and the, the regathering of Israel from Israel's dispersion that took place because of the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, 15. So what you have in verses 4 to 29 are signs leading up to Jesus's return to earth. And then verses 30 to 31 describe Jesus's return to earth, but not only his return, but his uh, gathering of saved Israel. So verse 30 says, and then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. So that sounds a lot like uh, Isaiah chapter 27, verses 12 to 13, with the great trumpet and the gathering of Israel after Israel had been scattered. But I think one of the things that we want to catch here is when you're dealing with verses 4 to 31, it's talking about a time period that leads up to the second coming of Jesus and, and the gathering of dispersed Israel. Now, we haven't seen the bodily second coming of Jesus and the gathering of dispersed Israel from the abomination of desolation. That hasn't occurred yet. But you're going to see a lot of you used in connection with that. So when I'm looking at this, the apostles are obviously asking Jesus a question, and he answers them by talking to them with, with you. And I do think there is a sense in which uh, the apostles represent Jesus's followers. Um, I think because the events are so heavily associated with events concerning Jerusalem and Israel, to see the apostles particularly linked and identified with, with Israel um, of, of the future, I think makes sense as well. Um, but I believe that there's a transgenerational you in Matthew 24, because Jesus is going to address the apostles as you as they ask that question. But then he starts talking about events in the future that the apostles will not see with their physical lives that come to an end uh, in the first century AD. Now, I personally think that even begins with the events of verse 4. Again, I understand there's other people who think 4 to 14, verses 4 to 14 is referring to the first century, and others think it's referring to the church age as a whole. Um, I think it's referring to uh, the future tribulation period. But I think when you get to verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation, that, that just simply has not occurred yet. That is still future from our standpoint. Um, that And then the, the rest of the use clearly leading up to the cosmic signs and then the return of Jesus to, to gather scattered Israel. Um, particularly when you hit verses 15 and following, it's very difficult to see those things as being fulfilled in the lifetime uh, of the apostles. So if that ends up being the case, then I think you end up uh, clearly having a, a transgenerational you, where Jesus is talking to the apostles, he's referring to them as you, but then he starts talking about events in the future. Now, where have we seen that before? We've seen that in, in Deuteronomy 4, in Deuteronomy 30. I know technically Leviticus 26 isn't a prophetic passage, but you see that sort of same idea there. And then we also saw it in Matthew 23. <laughs> so this idea of the transgenerational you, where you can be used to, uh, to speak to a current group of people with implications for the distant future, um, I, I, we, we see that happen a lot, and it makes, it makes uh, sense in this particular uh, context. I thought I would share with you a quote from Craig Blazing, who has addressed these issues as well. So regarding Deuteronomy chapter 4, Blazing makes a statement that's relevant to the Olivet Discourse. He says, the you here is spoken to that generation, 
you know, in, in regard to Deuteronomy 4, the generation of Moses' time. So the you here is spoken to that generation, but its fulfillment will not be found in them personally, but in a much later generation. In like manner, and this is where we get into all of the discourse implications, in like manner, Jesus addresses his disciples in the Olivet Discourse and speaks of you, but the ultimate fulfillment is to a later generation, one that will return to the Lord in the midst of the tribulation. So Blazing does what I've been doing as well, tying that transgenerational you. Uh, you see that in the Old Testament prophetic passages, and then you also see it with Jesus and the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. I also think it's significant too when you get to verse 36 that Jesus will say, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son of Man, but the Father alone. So when it comes to that day and hour, nobody knows when it's going to break forth. Well, what is that day and hour? Well, I I think it's the uh, the day and the hour of verses 4 uh, through 31. So uh, in verses 4 to 31, you have all these signs leading up to the return of Jesus. And that, that really answers the what of verse 3. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? That's answered in verses 4 to 31. But when it comes to, in verse 3, tell us when will these things happen, the when question is addressed in verse 36, which is of that day and hour, no one knows. Also the same in verse 42, therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. So I think when you look at the Olivet Discourse as a whole, you know, Jesus answers the what question first, you know, what's the sign of your coming in the end of the age? That's verses 4 through 31. And then the when question is addressed in, in verse 36 and 42, which is basically no one knows. And so, you know, once Jesus says no one knows when these events are about to break forth, that automatically puts uh, the you um, of these events being discussed in the indefinite future. Now, at the time of the apostles, when Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour, it could have happened shortly, at least from a human perspective. So from the apostles' perspective, they didn't know whether it could happen fairly soon or it would take a long, long time like it actually has been. Uh, and we still see from our standpoint that a lot of these events are still future. But once you're dealing with the indefinite future of certain events, uh, that really puts the transgenerational you in play. And then I think that also helps us with verse 34. When Jesus says, truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Well, what's the context for that? We're told in verse 32 to learn the parable of the fig tree when its branches already become tender and puts forth its leaves. You know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things, what's the all these things? What started from verses 4 through 31. When you see all these things, you what recognize that he is near right at the door. And then truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Now, some people think this generation demands first century fulfillment. But the key here is the analogy with the fig tree that when its branch has be already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you too, when you see all these things. So this generation is qualified as the generation that sees these things. Well, when are these things going to occur? Well, Jesus said, nobody knows the day or the hour. And it appears to be something that's still in the future because we have not seen the cosmic signs of the day of the Lord, uh, nor the regathering of Israel after dispersion and the second coming of Jesus. So when you look at the issue of the transgenerational you concerning future events concerning Israel, there's an indefiniteness to that. That is something that the Father knows. And it's going to be the generation that sees those things uh, occur, which I think starts in verse 4. That's going to be the generation that sees the second coming uh, of Jesus to earth, and then the uh, the salvation and restoration and gathering of Israel. So that's a little bit of how I would view Matthew 24. Again, the main thing that we've tried to do here is show that there is a very significant transgenerational you in the Bible concerning Israel. We've seen that in a lot of passages, and I also think that helps us with understanding Matthew 24.